So it's 2023 in Canada and things are changing, especially when it comes to the taxes that Canadians pay. Um, we've seen a number of changes implemented over the past year that are coming into effect as of January 1st, 2023, that will have Canadians paying a little bit more when it comes time for taxes, as well as some tools that have actually been expanded that could help you actually save some money. So let's talk about the areas that you are going to be spending some more money this year and how you can calculate how much you individually will need to spend, as well as the tools that you can use if you watch right till the end to get all of this information to make sure that you're paying the minimum amount possible and maybe even making a few bucks. So let's get right into the information and make sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so to make sure you keep on getting these Canadian focused financial updates right here on YouTube. Okay, so the way we're going to break this down, we're going to start with the few areas that you could end up paying a little bit more. And then in later in the video, we're going to go through those tools that can help you make sure that you're paying the minimum amount possible and taking advantage of all of the other tax changes that you can take advantage of. The first thing we're going to look at here is the changes to CPP premiums. CPP is of course the Canada Pension Plan, the sort of old age retirement plan that everyone pays into every single paycheck and then can sort of claim back once you hit those retirement ages. So it's kind of like you're paying it now, it feels bad because you're paying it, uh, it's coming off of your paycheck, but you do get to claim some of this money back once you hit that retirement age. And you can see here how these premiums have been increasing each year since 2019 as part of the government's plan to increase these CPP premiums, um, going from 5.1% back in 2019 to today's new rate of 5.95%. So if you're somebody who works for a company and they'll be matching half of your CPP, the amount that you're gonna have to pay from each paycheck is 5.95%. But if you are uh, self-employed or you own your own business, well then you're going to have to pay the full amount and you won't have have a company to match for you and that amount will now look like 11.9% of your paycheck each month will go towards this CPP premium. However, there is a maximum to the amount that you can contribute to CPP in a year or that you're forced to contribute to CPP each year. You can see that right here if you're doing the matching plan with an employer. Um, this is typically what would happen. Your maximum amount that you'll contribute over the year is $3,701. However, if you're self-employed, the maximum amount that you will contribute is $7,402 and you would at 11.9% reach these maximum uh, caps to your CPP contribution when you're making an income of six. $65,700. So all in all, that is a 0.25% increase to CPP premiums this year. So your paycheck, if you haven't gotten a raise, uh, well, it might look a little bit smaller. The next tax increase is certainly a controversial one that's been talked about a lot in the Canadian House of Commons, and that is the carbon tax. We're seeing a 30% increase in the carbon tax for 2023, as well as the inclusion of three provinces that weren't previously sort of under that carbon tax rule, and that is the addition of Nova Scotia, PEI, and Newfoundland. So they'll start to see carbon tax this year, uh, but the actual amount that the carbon tax will impact you in your pocketbook is different for different people and different depending on which numbers you look at. Uh, it's a little bit controversial, but I'll show you the numbers so you can make up your own mind. Typically, we've seen the Liberal government saying, okay, well, the carbon tax, the average Canadian gets more money back at the end of the year than they're actually paying into the carbon tax, whereas at the very same time, the Conservatives are saying the opposite is true and people are paying more than they get back. Why is there this conflicting uh, opinions? Well, it, this chart explains it perfectly. You can see in this chart for each province how much each Canadian can expect to pay into this carbon tax or even receive if the rebate that they receive from it would be higher than the amount that they've contributed, right? Um, and you can see this based on different income earners. This is the first 20%, the lowest 20% of income earners up to the fifth quintile, which is the highest 20% of income earners. So you can sort of see the data here. If you're seeing a negative number, well, that's the amount that you would actually receive back and not pay into the carbon tax. We're gonna get into how this number is a little bit uh, janky in a second here, but you can see on average in every single province, the average uh, consumer in that province would receive more money back from the carbon tax than they would actually pay into it. But this is only considering the, uh, the fiscal impact. So what this means is that this is only considering the amount that the actual average person pays into the carbon tax, not considering the downstream effects of the carbon tax, higher costs of transportation of goods, and how those, uh, those higher costs can feed into the prices of other things. This next chart will actually show that impact. 
and the numbers are quite a lot different. This is not just for the fiscal impact, but it's the fiscal and economic impacts taking into consideration all of the additional costs downstream on additional goods. And based on the parliamentary budget officer, this nonpartisan person who's put together a report on the carbon tax, you can see that on average, most people are paying into the program more than they are receiving in rebates. So that's why both parties can be saying totally opposite things and they can both be right. It's because they're looking at different charts, they're looking at different numbers, but in any respect leading into the new year with this carbon tax increase, the cost of goods and potentially the amount that you pay into the carbon tax could go up slightly here. But now let's get into the sort of neutral things. Let's talk about housing and tax and policy changes on housing going into 2023. There's one major one that is going to start in April and that is called the First Home Savings Account. I've made a video about this on the channel before, so if you you want the full details on how you can use this to help uh, save up a down payment for a purchase of a real estate property, well then you can check out that video right here. But as a quick summary, it's a $40,000 account that you can contribute to and it kind of works like a tax-free savings account or RRSP in that the growth of those funds inside of that account won't be taxed when you try to take that money out to put it towards a down payment. But again, if you click that link to check out the video, you'll get way more details on the FHSA that is coming to, into effect in 2023. Another big housing policy change that is hitting Canada, well, it actually has already hit it as of January 1st, 2023, is the, the ban on foreign buyers in Canada for a period of two years. Um, uh, many people believe that, uh, that lots of foreign buyers have bought properties in Canada, driving up the prices. Now, I don't think that this is the whole story, but let's go over what the rules here and then we'll talk about my take on it in a second. Some key notes about this ban are which houses actually qualify under this ban and, ban and which ones will be exempt because that's going to have an impact on where we actually see the impact of this act, right? So check this out. We can see that it is uh, residential properties and semi-detached houses and condominium units that this will apply to, but it will not apply to buildings with three or with more than three homes, right? So uh, this would apply to uh, single family homes, duplexes, triplexes. But when you get into those larger rental pro properties, fourplexes, all up, all the way up to sort of uh, apartment buildings that are larger, like in the 20s, this won't apply to those types of buildings. And additionally, sort of not here on the page, but I've done some additional research. Also, in this won't apply, apply in towns that have under 10,000 people uh, as their uh, population, as well as uh, recreational properties that's like lake houses and cottages. These won't be sort of uh, um, added into this foreign buyer's ban. And of course, when it comes to any regulation like this, enforcement has a big impact as well. The fine for uh, doing this is $10,000 as, as, as well as the pop, uh, possibility of the ordering of the sale of the house. Um, the, whether or not this is enough to discourage people from actually purchasing property in Canada, well, that we'll have to watch that over the next number of uh, years, the next two years. Now, here's why I don't think this foreign buyers ban is going to have a very large impact on real estate prices in Canada. It's because, well, it's not a very large portion of ownership that is actually foreign owners. You can see the averages for different provinces here. While the data is spotty for some of these central Canadian provinces, we see BC at 4.7%, Ontario at 3.4%, as well as higher numbers than expected in the Atlantic provinces, New Brunswick at 5.6%, same with Nova Scotia, St. John's, and uh, and Halifax, is the, like these individual cities as well. They're showing us the numbers here, but I think largely the impact of low interest rates for a long period of time uh, were what was what really drove up these real estate prices over the past number of years. And I think we will see a downward pressure on real estate as long as interest rates stay as high as they are right now. So it may look like this foreign buyer uh, ban is actually having an impact, but I think largely it's really the macroeconomic environment that is causing the change in housing prices rather than sort of this policy that sort of might be a check mark in some people's eyes when the government does it, but may not have a huge impact on the actual um, uh, supply and demand side, uh, the sort of price pressures on real estate. But now moving into more positive changes for your pocketbook, here are the new tax changes that you can actually take advantage of to make sure you're not paying as much tax in this next year, which I think will certainly be important as people try, try, try to tighten their pocketbooks for the 2023 year, expecting a continued recession into this year. So the first thing we're going to take a look at here is the income tax brackets for Canada. This is the income tax bracket for the previous year, 2021. In a second, we're going to look at 2022. But first, I wanted to explain um, just as a refresher how these tax brackets work in Canada, because I think it's largely misunderstood. 
People understand the concept of tax brackets like zero to $49,000 is taxed at a certain rate and $49,000 to $98,000 is taxed at a higher rate, right? And the more you make, the more you get taxed. But you don't actually flip into these tax brackets when you make that amount of income. For example, if I was making $48,000 and I made and then made a couple extra thousand dollars and flipped to $51,000, I wouldn't all of a sudden be taxed 20.5% on all of my income. No, I'd only be taxed 20 0.5% on the amount higher than $49,000. So it's kind of like a bucket that you fill up, right? Um, you can fill up your $49,000 bucket and for all of that income, you're going to be taxed at 15%. Again, this is last year's numbers. We're going to go over this year's numbers in a second. And then when you make over that bucket, it fall overflows into the new bucket of this tax bracket. And if you make more than $98,000, it overflows into here and only the overflowing income is what uh, gets taxed at the higher tax bracket rate. And the rates on this side, well, those actually haven't changed for 2022 when you're doing your taxes this year. But what has changed are these amounts on the left-hand side, and they've actually increased the size of some of these lower buckets, meaning that for more income, you'll be taxed on the lower rate, uh, and that it'll take more income to overflow that bucket and be taxed on the higher rate. Let's take a look at these new numbers. For that first bucket, the lowest income tax rate bucket, you can make up to $50,197, and that'll be taxed at 15%. And then this next bucket, 50,000 to 100,000 is taxed at 20.5. 100,000 to 155,000 is taxed at 26%. 155,000 to 221,000, uh, that's awesome if you're making that much money, would be taxed at 29%. And above $221,000 is taxed at 33%. So because the size of these lower uh, tax rate buckets has increased, marginally your tax that you're paying will be less. The next tax related thing that we need to talk about is the increasing of the basic personal amount. If you're not familiar with that basic terminology, that is the BPA or the basic personal amount, essentially the government sets each year an amount of money that you can make that you won't be taxed on as long as you make under that amount of money. Uh, and we've seen that increase this year. Take a look at this. Um, the goal is for in uh, 2023, the tax year of 2023, when you file your taxes in 2024, that that basic personal amount will be 15,000. But this this year, the year before that, our basic personal amount is $14,398. So the way this BPA deduction works is that you make whatever amount of money you're going to make, and this applies to absolutely everyone who makes money in Canada, and then you can subtract this basic personal amount from your income and then pay less taxes because your income will be $14,398 smaller than what you actually made. Also important to note that this is a non-refundable tax credit, meaning that if subtracting $14,398 from your income results in a negative number, you're not gonna get that money back, and this can only bring you to zero, right? It can't bring you into the negatives where the government would have to pay you money like certain other tax credits do. Those are called refundable tax credits. The BPA is a non-refundable tax credit. The next positive tax change is an increase to your TFSA contribution limit. That's your tax free savings account. And this is another misunderstood tool in Canada. Some people think that TFSA isn't a good name for it because if you're using your TFSA as a savings account, you're not reaching its maximum potential. It's actually far better to have a TFSA that you do some self-directed investing inside of. You don't have to actually only treat this as a savings account. It can be your investing account too. The beauty of this is that the gains on the investments that happen inside of this account, well, the government doesn't take tax on that growth of your investment. That's called capital gains tax and the TFSA is a great way to avoid those capital gains, but there is a maximum limit on the amount of money you can put into a TFSA and the amount of money that you can invest through your TFSA, and that has what inc has increased, and we'll take a look at this chart. Um, the, your amount that you can contribute starts accruing once I believe you hit the age of 18 in Canada, so for every year past your 18th birthday, you can add on whatever um, max contribution amount um, for that year is uh, leading up until the present. If you were 18 as of 2009 when the TFSA started, well, you can see that your uh, your contribution limit here is $88,000. Um, that's after this year's $6,500 increase to the TFSA contribution amount. 
if calculating how much you can contribute to your TFSA didn't make a lot of sense from what I just said, there's a very easy way that you can find out what that amount is. You can log into your CRA account, your Canada Revenue Agency account online, and there actually is a section on that website where you can see what your max TFSA contribution limit is, and you can invest that amount. Generally, I recommend you look into low fee index ETFs that can give you a broad exposure to the market instead of picking individual stocks. Um, this is a uh, way that you can sort to diversify your investments and pay very low management fees. And as a quick plug, if you're interested, you can actually open up a TFSA investing account through Wealth Simple, and you can check out the link in the description where you can get $50 for free when you set up your account for the first time. Another positive change that you can take advantage of is the increase in the maximum RRSP contribution. That is a registered retirement savings plan, another special account, a special tool that you can use in Canada to grow your wealth and also reduce the amount that you pay on your taxes. The very special thing about the RRSP is that when you make contributions to it, you actually re uh, deduct the amount uh, from, um, that you contribute to your RRSP from your income, meaning you pay less in income tax this year. Although when you take money out of the RRSP account, you do have to pay income tax on that. The idea is that you put money into your RRSP when you're making a lot of money in your peak earning years, and then when you're retired, you take it out, it's taxed at a lower rate, and it's tax advantaged. Now, the amount that you can contribute to your RRSP in each calendar year is related to the amount of money that you make. Uh, it's actually calculated at a rate of 18%. So 18% of your net income, the income that you show on your taxes after whatever Whatever deductions you're making. Well, the 18% of that number is the amount you can put into your RRSP, and that hasn't changed. That's the same year to year. But what has changed is the cap, the maximum amount that you can uh, that you can put into your RRSP. So uh, the previous cap was $29,210, meaning you'd hit that cap amount at $163,000 of income, and now that cap has been raised to $30,780, um, which is 18% of 100. $171,000 of income. So this uh, increase will largely impact high income earners in terms of the amount that they can um, add to their RSP account to reduce their taxes. But this is a helpful reminder to absolutely everybody in Canada that if you expect to make less income in the future, maybe you're planning on retiring, an RSP is a great way to reduce the amount of taxes that you're going to be paying on your 2022 income this year. But that just about does it for some of these major changes that are happening in 2023 for Canadians and their pocketbooks. If I've missed any, let me know down in the comments. I read absolutely every single one and try to reply to a bunch of them. And also I have a friend who has recently gotten into the YouTube business as well and has made a channel and just reached a thousand subscribers. The channel is all about arts and crafts and sort of uh, different uh, sort of tri tips and tricks. So if you're interested in that sort of stuff, you can follow Elizabeth. There's a link down there in the description. Uh, I'd appreciate you helping out my, my good friend there. But with all that said, thanks so much for watching everybody. I really hope this video has helped you out at least a little bit and I'll see you next time.